And so, yes, so welcome to the Data Hour. I'm really looking forward to talking about ChatGPT and the future of NLP systems. And basically, I'd like to just give you a kind of a quick overview of um, what we'll be talking about today. And first, I want to start with just discussing some of the distinguishing features of large language models. And ChatGPT is probably the large language model that's gotten the most attention recently. And I don't want to spend a lot of time going over um, a lot of the details about ChatGPT that have been covered elsewhere, because I think there are a lot of interesting questions and aspects about ChatGPT and large language models that haven't gotten as much attention as I think they should have. And so those are the things that I'm hoping we can we can focus on. And in particular, I want to focus on things like what what things are not quite working as expected. There's a lot of enthusiasm for large language models, but let's see where things start to break down and then start to look at how do we approach those challenges? Like, how are we going to address those? And then I'd like to look at, you know, chat GPT as a point of inflection in the history of natural language processing, because it really is, this really is an important moment. I've um, been working in this field uh, or started working in this field uh, decades ago and have seen a lot of really interesting advances. And I think this, this moment, this, the last few years have been some of the most significant. And so one question is, well, what comes next? And so we'll take a look um, at some, some ways that we might advance the discipline. And then finally, we'll, we'll wrap up with conclusions and some questions and answers. Um, so briefly about me, um, you know, as as we pointed out, my name is Dan Sullivan, and I'm a, a data architect. I am with Hydraulics right now, where we focus on um, very large scale data um, storage and issues and uh, analytics and stream processing. And um, I've been in this field for for several decades, or, or a few decades, over a few decades, anyway. And I've worked in a lot of different areas. I actually started my career in um, my first paying professional job was as a Lisp programmer developing expert systems. And I pretty quickly shifted gears and started working in natural language processing. And so in the early days, I sort of used techniques that aren't used a lot anymore, like augmented transition networks and deterministic parsers then moved on to more statistical oriented approaches. And the most recent work I've done has been in um, natural language processing and biomedical literature, um, particularly around uh, genetics and inf infectious disease genomics. Um, I'm also an online trainer and author. Um, so I have courses and books and I'd be happy to share those. Um, if you wanna contact me later, I have my contact information. I'd be happy to share links with you. Um, so first, I want to take a quick look at ChatGPT and large language models. Um, so if you haven't used ChatGPT, it's really, it's a lot of fun. It's really kind of interesting um, to play with it and see how good it is. And this is, uh, you know, things like this here. I posed a question, you know, how is data science different from data engineering? And it gave a really good answer. Like, this is just a rock solid, I would expect somebody who's familiar with the field to give an answer like this. And this is the kind of thing that's generated a lot of excitement um, around chat GPT. And, and this is a pretty straightforward, very kind of pragmatic kind of use case. People have been really creative and come up with things like, you know, have, you know, explain quantum physics, you know, in the, in the, uh, as, as Dr. Seuss would, or, a, or if you were writing a children's book on quantum physics. So people are, are being really creative with how they use it. And it sparks a lot of interest and in, and in kind of projection or or conjecture that oh maybe this is really like a general artificial intelligence and it's really that's really not the case this is an excellent tool it's quite a, a an impressive feat of engineering and I'm sure companies like Microsoft and OpenAI and Google are gonna are build really useful products around this um, but it's important to understand what it is and what it's not. Now, part of ChatGPT, the T in ChatGPT, um, refers to transformers, and transformers is it's a a, a type of architecture with a, a it, in which deep learning networks are broken into or, or like blocks or several layers, and within these blocks we have um, a number of different layers, but that do 
particular kinds of things. And, and in particular, what these blocks are really good at is being able to kind of keep track of, of items that we want to focus on in, say, long strings of words. Or it also works with other sequences, like amino acid sequences. If we want to figure out, you know, given a um, an amino acid sequencer, essentially a description of what kinds of amino acids are in a protein. What is the shape of that protein? What, how does that, the sequence of amino acids conform around or force that, that sequence into a particular three-dimensional shape? That's the same technology that works really well with reading or analyzing words and then kind of figuring out what is the, what is being represented by this sentence? What's being stated by a particular sentence? And really the thing, that one of the, the most innovative things about transformers is that they have figured out, the, the inventors of the transform figured out a way to keep track of uh, things that we need to focus on. And they refer to it as attention. And uh, the name of the paper that they wrote um, when this was first released is called Attention is All You Need. And they, they go into great detail about how they use tensors to, to kind of measure the important relative importance of words and relationships to all other words, for example, within a sentence. So the transformer was a really just a huge advance and it um, sort of replaced things like um, long short-term memory or LSTMs and other kinds of recurrent neural networks as really the, the best way to kind of deal with sequences, again, like in natural language processing or in, in other sequence um, problems like in, in proteomics and looking at um, protein structures. Now, another thing that, that kind of sets the large language models apart from earlier um, NLP models is what, what are being called the foundation models. And these are models that are trained on different kinds of data. So it might be text data, uh, audio data, uh, visual data. And, and what we're trying to do is build a almost like a, a general purpose model that takes in different types of data and learns in unsupervised ways. And, and that provides the sort of, as the name implies, like a foundational deep learning network that has been pre-trained, which can then be fine-tuned for specific tasks like answering questions or extracting information or doing object recognition. And so we can do fine tuning in different ways, maybe with labeled data or with human in the loop reinforcement learning. But the idea again around a foundation model, which is really critical, is that we use a lot of uh, data from different of different types from different sources in an unsupervised way to kind of build up that base level or foundation level uh, neural network. Now, another thing that goes on with the um, this kind of foundation model is that we can pull in data from different types. And so um, what we're doing is actually working with multiple uh, modalities or uh, multimodal models. And one uh, that, for example, is from Google is called Palm E. And Palm is their um, uh, one of their, their foundation models. And it uses data from different kinds of, of tasks like visual analysis or language instructions. And what they found is that when they train a, a model using only one type of data, they get you know modest performance. You know, in terms of rates of accuracy, you know something, you know, not quite fifty percent in in best cases. But when they combine multiple kinds of data, so multi multiple modes of data like visual and and um, language data, then you get much better performance. So what we're seeing, what ChatGPT and, and other large language models are showing is that this approach of using transformers for being able to focus along long sequences, along with foundation models, which incorporate data um, in unsupervised learning models from of different types of modalities, can radically improve the, the quality of the models that we build. And that's the basis for things like ChatGPT or GPT-4 or BARD, the service that was recently announced by, by Google. But the thing that we do want to also keep in mind about these the large language models, like I just described, is that those are generative AI. So they're not doing classification directly, but they they basically predict, make predictions about sequences. And so that's really important to understand. It, it's a really useful tool, and we can use it in a lot of different ways, but there are limits to it.
in spite of the limits, there are, in addition to the limits, I should say, there are also some really interesting emergent properties that seem to be cropping up in large language models. And so these are properties that weren't necessarily expected, they weren't necessarily planned for, but they are interesting kinds of things that are showing up. One of these emergent properties is um, the ability to do basic logical reasoning or arithmetic reasoning. And one way to do that is with something called a chain of thought prompting. So here's an example where we're talking about someone who has some, some tennis balls and they, they use some balls and they get some more balls and how many did they have at the end of the story? Well, when we just do standard prompting, such as shown in this slide, what we see is the um, chat GTP or, or the large language model didn't get the correct answer. However, when we show an example of how to do the reasoning, like Roger started with five balls, two cans of three balls, each with six and so on, and we show sort of show the math kind of um, approach, then the model can pick up from that, can discern patterns um, within that, that sort of instruction, within that answer phrase, and then apply it to other text. So here's another example of something that's really useful from a, a pragmatic like application perspective. It would be really useful if we had an assistant that we could lead through some kind of chain of thought prompting to help us solve particular problems and analyze, you know, text. Like here's an example of how I'd like you to, you know, process this particular piece of text. And then they you, you sort of train your, your model and it gets it, like the model output on the right is correct. And then you apply that to a whole you know, large volume of text that you need to analyze. So this is really useful. This is also the kind of thing that, that can kind of lead people astray if you don't really pay attention to the limits of what chain of thought prompting is actually doing. Because we might start inferring that the program is behaving, say, the way a human being might be behaving. Like if you're talking to a colleague and you're showing an example of how to do something and your colleague starts being able to reason about it, you might think, well, oh, they have these very clear ideas. They have these concepts. They're generalizing. That's not the case of what's going on in large language models. At least that's not, you know, that does not seem to be the case. And we know that because it, it reasoning like that chain of prompt, um, uh, chain of thought prompting and other kinds of exercise around reasoning pretty quickly break down. <clears throat> so there are some challenges with the large language models that I want to take a look at. And um, in particular, I want to look at um, sort of the limits. Are we, we're plateauing in terms of performance gains when we're thinking about just, you know, throwing more CPUs at a problem or more data or adding more parameters to the model. There are limits to what we can do, the, the gains that we're going to get um, pushing those boundaries. Also, there's the problem of hallucinations in large language models. And basically, that's, that's the idea of where, where the models are making up things that are either contradictory or inconsistent or untrue. And then finally, another challenge I want to take a look at is the brittleness of reasoning that's going on right now with um, large language models. So we have seen, this, or researchers, you know, the community has seen that um, scale really is important. And what we're looking at here is a, um, a figure from a paper, um, I believe it was by Google researchers, where basically what they found is that the loss or the error that we had when in learning really just dramatically dropped when um, we increased the compute resources or the data size or the number of parameters in the model. And they, they found they could get a linear, um, um, consistent um, monotonic decrease in the loss or decrease in error just by increasing uh, you know these three resources and that's really impressive and you think well okay that's great we you know we just need to keep adding more we just need to keep scaling but that's not always the case and in fact some research at meta um looking at the llama model found that actually it they pretty quickly plateaued. Well pretty quickly we're talking billion you know size very large training sets but when working with very large training sets, they found th that the accuracy rates started to plateau at some point. And this occurred across different kinds of um, question answering tasks, reasoning tasks. So it, it wasn't just a particular kind of problem where 
accuracy, improvement in accuracy leveled off. It was kind of across the board in a, a number of different kinds of um, benchmarks. So what we need to understand is that just building very large models and using these kind of um, standardized or homo, um, homogeneous architectures, uh, there are limits to that. Um, even what, if we have a lot of data, a lot of compute resources and you know very large models with very large parameters, we need to do more than just add more layers or add more, um, do more of the same of what we have been doing. So that's one of the, the challenges that we're facing sort of in the next wave of innovation in NLP. Another problem that, that is really probably the one that's gotten the most attention sort of in the general discussion when we're outside of you know, computer scientists and AI researchers and data scientists talking about um, large language models and more in like the general public, the hallucinations is really probably the, the most um, sort of aware um, challenge and there are two types of hallucinations, or what, what are known as intrinsic hallucinations. And that's where, where something, it, the, the model basically contradicts itself as it's generating something. And there's also extrinsic hallucinations. And those are things that cannot be verified in the training content. So that's when the, the model, it's basically, you know, large language models have been described as just like statistical pattern recognition engines. And it and it basically generates like the next token. They've been trained to, to predict. Um, if you have a phrase like, welcome to this talk on data blank, and you want to predict what's the next word, you know, data sci science would be a good prediction. So these models are really good at making those kind of generative predictions. And then we can harness that to, to solve different kinds of problems. We use that as a tool to solve different things, but it can also generate things or statements that are not true. Um, so that's what an extrinsic hallucination is. And researchers have found that there are different ways that these hallucinations come about. Sometimes um, it's simply a matter of there's what's <laughs> euphemistically phrased as misalignment between statement and ground truth. And basically that is we've trained the model on text that makes statements that are not true. And I'm sure, you know, we've all experienced disinformation and things that aren't true and either, you know, intentionally or unintentionally um, making statements that aren't true. But that's one problem. Um, and that just comes with the nature of what, how we're training things. Like we can't, we don't have enough humans to curate, um, say, reading material or language material to be training on trillions, you know, scales of trillions of tokens. There's also the problems with um, imperfect representation. So the learning process doesn't necessarily, you know, there are shortcomings. There are, we don't capture, you know, a concept quite as we should or in decoding. So when we're generating things, that's sort of the flip side. And then also there is this problem because um, these are generative AI models. So they're building things, they're generating streams of tokens or streams of, of text, one, you know, words at a time or phrases at a time. When we're generating, um, we're actually building or making predictions for the, say, the next word that we're going to predict based on words that we have also predicted. So it's a little bit different from when you're training. When you're training, you're looking at things that presumably people have written. When you're when the model's generating, it's basing it what it generates on what it has seen before in terms of the training, but also what it has generated for this particular task. So we could start veering off um, and and kind of turning, you know, we we start maybe um, have a, a slight variation, maybe not quite accurate, and then it keeps getting building on those inaccuracies keep building as we predict more. So that's another way that we come ac across or, or um, uh, experience these hallucinations from the model's perspective. Now, another problem we have is um, brittleness of reasoning. And this comes in because um, fundamentally, we are generating streams of text or streams of tokens. And there really isn't like what, what we might, you know, kind of um, uh, in a very kind of basic way, think about like how we have concepts in our mind and we think about things. There aren't those conceptual representations or data structures in these models. So here's an example from Murray Shanahan, who is a researcher at DeepMind. I think he also teaches at a, a university in the UK. And he really has this 
concise example that shows how things can go wrong. And here he is, uh, uh, Shanahan is having a, a conversation with a large language model. And the, um, the model thinks that these three dots over on the right are a traffic light. So, okay, well, so it's not a traffic light. Traffic lights are, you know, use red, yellow, and green. Um, and so there, there are different questions. It's like, can you see three circles? Yes, I see three circles. What color are they? Red, blue, and green. Well, there's no green in there. So it's it's as if Flamingo, the, the language model, is basing the idea that it's already thought it's looking at a traffic light. So the green must be there. So that's, you know, that's one example of the of a hallucina hallucination where it's probably basing a, a choice on the the words to generate based on what it's generated in the past. And so this is an example of how you can kind of steer yourself wrong. And then Shanahan in the second um, post of it on Twitter asked, where's the green circle? And, and Flamingo said, oh, it's on the right. And, and he asked, well, what do you mean? Where, what do you wear on the right? And it's like to the right of the blue circle. And again, that's clearly not the case. That's, that's not grounded in reality. So, and I, I can't come up with like plausible explanations as to why it, you know, why it would say it's on the right. So this is just an example of the bitter brittleness of reasoning. And this is not a criticism of large language models. I think it is it's an interesting phenomenon. And actually, this is one of the areas that's really ripe for additional research. So one of the things that's so exciting about this, this point in time in NLP is that the that large language models are such an impressive accomplishment. But you know, it's not general AI. And so there are these things like this, this hallucination, hallucination property, these things that are emerging, hallucinations that like an emergent property that are rich areas for study. Like we really need to apply scientific principles and you know the scientific method to analyzing hallucinations to really understand how to get past them, why they occur and how do we deal with them. So how do we have these challenges? How do we sort of take them on? And I'm just gonna talk about just three approaches and you probably ask anybody else in the field um, who's been doing working in this field for a while or has ideas about this field, they might come up with other approaches. And these, I certainly don't want to say like, these are the right ways to do it. These are just three possibilities and we can take a look at them and you know maybe they'll trigger some ideas in you for some other ways of dealing with some of these problems. So basically, uh, the first is I want to take a look at Mars level of analysis. And um, that refers to some work by uh, uh, neuroscientist and um, computational neuroscience researcher David Marr, who did work in the 70s. Unfortunately, he died young at 35. But um, right after he died, a, a book of his called Vision was uh, published posthumously. And in that book, he he sort of captured this idea of levels of analysis, and it's really a great framework um, for trying to understand computational intelligence and uh, just kind of think through problems. So I want to um, talk about that a little bit, and then I want to go back to to modularity and representations, and these were two kind of dominant themes in AI as people were. Um, working in AI sort of before the deep learning revolution around like 2006 when um, uh, deep learning researchers had kind of come up with efficient ways to train large networks, uh, there was really a shift away from like symbolic AI and more toward deep learning, which has been incredibly fruitful. Um, but there were some things that were done prior to the deep learning revolution that may be useful now that we've kind of reached this plateau, a plateau um, in, in deep learning. Uh, there's certainly more to get from deep learning, but it may also be time to start combining the two. And, and that's where the complementary approaches to deep learning come in. It's like, maybe we keep building on deep learning and we start adding some things in, um, some ideas that, that um, dominated in uh, symbolic AI. So Mars level of analysis, um, it's really, there's three levels and he divides kind of computational problems into three levels. And the first is the computational and that's the highest level. And that's like, that describes what problem we're trying to solve. And it, it might be vision, for example. And for Mar, as a neuroscientist, he was looking um, very much at like biological solutions to problems. So he was trying to understand 
how do how do um, you know um, creatures that see how do they solve the problem, but while also contributing to solving the problem, like from a computational side, how do we get machines to learn how to see? So the computational looks looks at the problem that's being solved. The algorithm level is basically what what kind of algorithms and data structures are we using? Are we using deep learning? Are we using symbolic AI to solve these problems? And then finally, the implementation. So that's where we get into like, like the hardware implementation. So for deep learning, we might be used GPUs or TPUs or CPUs, uh, but those same kind of implementation mechanisms can also be used to implement like symbolic AI where we're doing um, different kinds of things. So I point out Mars level of analysis because it's important to, to keep these three levels distinct as we're thinking about when things don't work, where are things going wrong? It's probably not at the hardware implementation level. Um, you know, it's probably, you know, there may be problems at the computational, at the, at the theory, like how we're framing the problem of say vision or language generation, or it could be we're missing something at the representation algorithm level. And what we want to avoid doing is um, kind of focusing on the wrong level. We want to identify which where the problem resides that we're working on in the level, and then we can start to find appropriate tools and approaches. So one thing about deep learning that um, is, is a, a kind of a, a not um, always the case, but a common characteristic is that we have kind of um, common patterns or just, um, or we train models as a single unit or um, we we allow the network to maybe break down and and learn its own kind of um, like levels of reasoning or tasks that maybe different levels do. So, for example, in a vision problem, early layers of a vision model might detect lines, and then later layers might detect shapes that are made up of a uh, composition of multiple lines, and then there might be later. Um, further layers down the way that do additional sort of higher level processing. So we have that kind of modularity or division of labor um, within deep learning. But another way to kind of divide up the labor is to use a, a technique that in machine learning, it's often called referred to as ensemble methods where we have, we learn um, or different experts or different say trees in a random forest will learn different prediction models and then we assemble those models we basically think about experts like each like each tree in a random forest might have a say or a, a vote and in this case in this diagram we're looking at what's known as a, a mixture of experts architecture where we have different models that have been trained and they each kind of give their expert opinion in, in a sense and then we we learn to kind of choose between which expert or we weight the experts differently we learn how to weight their their inputs to get an output so this is the kind of modularity so it's modular in the sense that each expert is its own module and this is kind of a fine grain um, modularity. It's at a, at a fairly low level, and we can do this at a, say, a network level. Um, we can combine, we can train different networks and then combine them and use like a gating network to, to learn um, how to combine the weights of those. This kind of mixture of experts has shown um, to work really well in some cases. Um, here's a an example from a large learning model uh, excuse me, a large language model that used mixture of experts. And what they found is that they were able to get really good performance um, in a number of tasks um, better than, than um, using sort of a, a more monolithic approach. And they were able to train with fewer resources. So um, what we can see already is that, you know, we might be tapering off. If you remember that uh, previous slide that showed the, um, I'll jump back to it, the leveling off, this one. So we, we see this leveling off. Well, one approach to this is, okay, if you're starting to level off, then maybe you shift from the more monolithic approach to um, trying something like this, like the using the mixture of uh, experts model, which is a, again, kind of a finer grain level of modularity. But modularity, when we talk about modularity, like um, sort of pre deep learning days, back in the sort of symbolic AI, when symbolic AI was dominant, um, it was really more like a, at a macro level modularity, like we see in, in the human brain, there's, you know, different modules, like we have, you know, 
parts of our brain are really good at dealing with, you know, auditory processing and others are really parts of the brain are really good with visual processing. And so evolution has been, you know, at work on this planet for, you know, like on the order of three and a half billion years. And so, you know, one of the ways evolution has solved the problem of intelligence is a tool that solves a lot of problems and human brains and uh, modular brains is one of the sort of architectures that evolution has come up with. And it's not just like our like vertebrate brains, human brains. Um, evolution has also solved this problem with distinct methods, but still using modularity in things like cephalopod brains, so like uh, octopus and squid. And this is an example of what's known as convergent evolution, where um, two different sort of evolutionary paths have solved a problem um, and come or come up with a solution. In this case, it's like intelligent brains, problem-solving brains that are able to do things like process visual information with two different kinds of solutions. Like there, there, there isn't a lot of commonality, say, between cephalopod brains and human brains, but both are modular. So th there's something about modularity and complex systems and intelligence that it's not necessary. It's not obviously necessary for building intelligence system, but modularity is is a good candidate as a way of moving forward, like try a, a technique that we probably should be exploiting. And so, if we think of brains as kind of that hardware implementation level in Mars hierarchy, or excuse me, Mars level of analysis, that's one kind of modularity. Another kind of modularity is that like a functional cognitive level. And this is more like from a, as a computer science person, I think more in terms of like data structures and algorithms, a cognitive science psychologists might think of these as more as like abstract models for describing the way people think about things. So there's this functional cognitive level where modularity also plays a role. And here we're looking at a, at a, a diagram that, again, it has more of a sort of psychology, cognitive science orientation. It's like, how do you describe human intelligence at a cognitive level? And so this kind of modularity has, has been important in the history, especially of AI, especially on the symbolic side. And we see it, um, if you're interested in like getting some more details about this, Jerry Fodor is a cognitive scientist um, who's worked on this a lot and he has a book called modularity of mind and um so he he has sort of a cognitive science approach uh society of mind by marvin minsky minsky was the former head of um the ai lab at mit and it's a similar idea it's like he, for him the the metaphor is that that intelligence is like a society of experts and they're they're all good at different things and how do they function together and then another example is in linguistics uh, Chomsky has has used the phrase or the metaphor of a language organ in the brain. And so, um, again, it's metaphorical, but it's this idea that there are module structures and that, you know, for, for Chomsky, a big question for him is how do people learn language so quickly? I mean, we're children when we learn languages. And so he has some really well-developed ideas around language acquisition and and um, and also formal models about what's the nature of human language. And so a lot of his work is really dense and I wouldn't necessarily, you know, recommend reading it, but just directly, but but being aware that, you know, this idea of modularity is is pretty rich and it's pretty well researched. So if you're looking for sources for new ideas, like there's I would definitely recommend these books and related topics. Now, another thing um, in terms of going back to, you know, where can we get some ideas? How do we think about new way or how do we think about our problems in slightly different ways is thinking about how we're representing the information or the knowledge that we are trying to capture in our machine learning models and AI systems. And in deep learning, we use distributed representations. So, for example, we might have this concept of a boat. And we might see an image of a boat. And so in the deep learning network, what that means is that representation is some combination of like activations or weights um, that are, are somehow, like when we see the boat, when we have an image of this boat and we're processing that, the network is in a certain state. And that is a distributed representation. And distributed work representations work really well with perceptual kind of processing problems like understanding words that you're hearing or seeing images um, as opposed to like 
trying to describe symbolically what something is, um, like seeing a boat. It's very hard to describe in words, but you can show someone a picture and, and we immediately as humans understand what that is. So distributed representation works well in some cases, like for some problems. In other cases, more structured symbolic representations can be more useful. Like here's an example of a structured representation that was used in a language generation system. Um, again, this is sort of early, this is sort of an early one um, going back to sort of the pre deep learning uh, era where when people were working on language generation, they were thinking in terms of planning. Well, what is it the person wants to say? What are the components that we need to talk to? So a very top-down approach, which is different from the deep learning, which we can think of as almost like bottom-up, where we start with data and then we try and figure out how we can use statistics to generate a sequence of sequence of tokens. Those are two very different ways of looking at the problem, the computational problem we're trying to solve, that top level of Mars level of analysis. Two very different ways. And neither one is like right or wrong but it's like how can we use them together like we have two things that work well and they address different parts of of this computational problem so we probably want to start thinking about how we can combine these now here's an example um of someone who is doing that this is someone uh, a research team who is using deep learning and they're, what they're trying to do is basically um work with visual question answering and what they're finding is that they're proposing using a combination of uh, deep learning using like um, deep learning networks of different types like recurring um, neural nets or convolutional neural nets along with more symbolic oriented kind of approaches like decision trees and having sort of a classification knowledge base so it's as if you use for example the cnn's the convolutional neural networks to identify a picture and identify oh that's a boat and then you have a knowledge base which might be a more use a more structured representation based on sort of symbolic AI kind of techniques where we have information about boats, like boats are types of transportation devices and they float on water and, and things like that, all kinds of collections of logical propositions. Those logical propositions are more readily represented in symbolic ways. So again, it's not like one of these approaches are right and the other's wrong. It's like, how do we leverage both of them to solve the computational problem that we're trying to solve? So, so with that, so with, you know, we, we recognize we, this is a huge accomplishment, what uh, large language model research has done and people in deep learning have done. And so, you know, if you are in graduate school, you're thinking about graduate school, you want to get into NLP, if you're thinking, oh, wait, is it, is it done? Is the field exhausted? Absolutely not. This is a great time to get in because we have a really valuable building block with deep learning and things like generative AI. And now there are a lot of problems that come with it. So how do we, how do we do the next level? Like where's the next big advance going to come from? So there are a few things that I would just suggest keeping in mind. And I say this as someone who has, um, experienced like the overzealousness thinking, oh, we have done it. We're, we're like on the cusp of something huge. And then you find out, oh, no, like you might have, you, you, the group of AI research we collectively at some point in time might have had some great accomplishments. Somebody's got a series of accomplishments, but it's not general AI. We're not there. We're not even close. We weren't close 40 years ago. We're not close now. But it can be intoxicating working in this field. And so like a researcher at deep learning was like tweeted, oh, it's like game over. Scale is what you need. We just need to keep scaling. But that's not the case. We saw that with like the brittle brittleness. Um, actually, yeah, that example with the traffic light earlier was from another researcher at, um, uh, at DeepMind. So we want to avoid these reactions where it's like, oh, chat GPT, we're on the verge of general AI because we're really not. And that, again, I'm, that's not a criticism of anybody in the field. I get excited about this too, but it's just like, we just need to understand. It's like, right, we, we have to have a pragmatic, very scientific approach to this. And um, I think we, we need to kind of take a critical eye sometimes. And like Chomsky, I, who's probably done more than any single person I can think of to advance natural language processing is very critical of chat GPP. And he, his big concern is that we are fostering this, we, the sort of computer science AI community is fostering this idea um, in the general public that, that somehow chat GPT 
T is intelligent. And again, as someone for Chomsky has thought a lot about like modularity of mind and cognitive science questions, as well as specific linguistics questions and computational linguistic question, he feels like there's a the chat GTP is fundamentally flawed as a conception of language and knowledge. Right. It is an engineering marvel, but it's a tool that, again, Microsoft, Google, OpenAI will probably make some really useful products for, but we shouldn't be walking around thinking it's a model or it's somehow comparable to cognition that goes on, say, in human brains or cephalopod brains or, you know, any other intelligent um, creature. So, so how do we start addressing this? How do we start getting to something more than generating a sequence of tokens and doing like statistical pattern recognition. Um, Judah Pearl, who's a computer scientist who has done a lot of work in like reasoning about causality, has said something to the effect of, you know, deep learning is basically um, statistical curve fitting. And, and that's, that statement is true enough to be insightful. And there it is. And it, so it's like deep learning is a great tool, but it's not the whole thing that we need. And so where do we go for ideas for that, again, that kind of next level? And one place to look is cognitive science. That's so an area of psychology that has been really rich and really active, um, certainly as long as AI has been around. And AI is generally, you know, considered as starting around 1959, 1960. There was a cart uh, uh AI conference at a college in the Northeast US called Dartmouth at that time when a lot of the early kind of researchers kind of started formulating research programs. About 20 years after that, Jerry Fodor, who wrote that book on modularity, came up with this paper um, that was published in Behavior and Brain Science, which was really seminal in this idea about machines thinking, because people, a, a lot of times um, there are criticisms like machines can't really understand, they don't have relationships to like things out in the world. It's just, you know, it's all in their data structures. It's all, you know, proverbially in their head. And Fodor argued that we can have come up with models of concepts that are just limited, just whatever is internal to the machine. And, and he actually advocated this as a research strategy, he called it methodological solipsism, as a strategy for understanding cognitive psychology in humans. But it's also really useful from a perspective of how do we start building models? How do we think about conceptual representations in a machine and start thinking about semantics and how, how um, concepts relate to one another from within a machine perspective so that we can start getting past this issue of machines don't really understand, they don't know what words mean, and actually start building some semblance of a uh, some representation of what how we can manage semantics in computational models. Now, another thing we need to deal with is causality. Um, so right now, deep learning models are great at, again, that statistical curve fitting. We're looking at a bunch of data. They don't reason about cause and effect. There's also this question, we as humans, uh, you know, kind of have this sense of time and space, and that may be one of sort of our conceptual models. So we may have time and space also our key fundamental building blocks of cognition. So how do we start to capture those? Now, there are a number of books, and again, Judah Pearl is probably the person that's written the most on this, or uh, most popular, you know, made it um, generally available. There's a book that's available um, uh, in open source, it's a Creative Commons license, Elements of Causal Inference. If you're interested in this, I would definitely grab that book. That's a great one to get started with. Um, also, we want to make sure we listen to criticisms. Like, you know, I'm advocating for, you know, causal reasoning and modularity, but there are a lot of people in um, in psychology and cognitive science who would say, no, that's totally the wrong way to go. And I think it's important that not only do we kind of drill into topics we're interested in and like learn, you know, the math and the the computer science um, uh, and the and the AI and the linguistics about stuff we're interested in, but we also want to you know, listen to people who are critical of what we're trying to do and take it. It's what it's just, you know, it's a better way to kind of solve problems. But basically, critics do a lot of work for us, all right? They're helping us understand where the weak spots of what our models are and, you know, our approaches are. And so let's take advantage of all the work and the effort they put into like 
telling us how wrong we are and and use those points the the valid points that they're making as kind of starting points for trying to look for new insights or solve problems that are that we really do need to address and i would say in that same kind of kind of vein i would say you know in the in uh, the idea is we don't want to repeat history and back in um, 1969, Marvin Minsky, the author of the book on um, Society of Mind, he and a cognitive science uh, researcher, uh, Maurice Pepperett, wrote a book called Perceptrons. And it was critical of like perceptrons, like uh, early single layer neural uh, neuron, like uh, computational neuron. And one of the things they pointed out is that like a single layer neuron can't calculate exclusive or and therefore you know people started thinking oh well then it's not a good you know building block for intelligence and it's really unfortunate because you know not, it's not necessarily minsky and pepper wanted to squash research on perceptrons completely but it really had that kind of effect it changed kind of changed the tone it's like oh yeah perceptrons they were kind of dismissed which is unfortunate um because a lot of people then focused on symbolic ai and didn't put a lot of work into perceptrons Fortunately, there were people like Jeffrey Hinton who, you know, kind of just kept working at it and came up with things like backpropagation and eventually, you know, the, the, the efficient training of large neural networks. So we definitely want to avoid like this idea of, in our case, like at, at this point in time, it's like everybody jumping on the deep learning bandwagon. Yes, that's great. We want to focus on that, but that's not the only thing we should be focusing on. So just to wrap up with some conclusions. Um, yeah, large language models, they're really a significant engineering achievement, and I'm sure we're going to see um, companies make really useful products for them. But they're not the basis for general AI, you know, and I'd say, you know, suggest reading the, the op-ed piece by Chomsky on, on this and why they're not a ba the basis for AI. We are definitely at an inflection point in natural language processing, and because we have these really great tools now with large language models, but now we really, I think the focus needs to be on addressing some of the problems and um, that large language models have, and those will drive sort of research into more fundamental questions around things like representation and modularity. And I think, you know, the earlier work in AI that was more oriented on symbolic AI is it uh, will, is a good starting point, like looking for ideas. I'm definitely not saying that we should just take what was done, you know, 30, 20, 30, 40 years ago and start trying to apply it now. But I think it's worth looking at to see if it just triggers any ideas in you to, to address some of the problems that we know we have. Um, and I do want to leave you with, um, you know, one quote from a... Uh, paper on foundational models. And again, the foundational model, these are the, the newer models that are coming out that are trained across data sets. Um, while they work really well, um, they're, they, as I have kind of highlighted just some of the problems, what I want to point out is the researchers on foundational models um, believe that um, that much of the critical research on foundation models will require deep inter interdisciplinary collaboration. And this, I just, I want to drive this home. It's like, yeah, it, this is not about learning more math or more computer science. I mean, that's part of the problem, but it's not the only thing. We need to be working with linguists and computational psychologists and other people and like neuroscientists who are experts in vision. Like this is really going to be um, a problem as we push to the next level in NLP, it's going to be a problem that's going to take ideas from multiple disciplines and multiple um, areas of expertise. So with that, I just want to thank you. This is, uh, I appreciate your time. Um, please feel free to contact me, Dan at Hydraulics.io. Um, if you want to um, connect by email or Dan Sullivan PDX on, um, on LinkedIn. I'm going to jump over to the Q&A channel. Uh, let's see. It's often said GPT is based on transfer users. Decoder only and models like BERT are based on encoder only. I that's interesting. I have not heard that. I don't. Um, yeah. I mean, certainly there's encoding. We need to encode words. Um, I'm thinking just in terms of text now, not other modalities. Um, we tend to encode things into um, encodings or embeddings. So you're going to be using encoders and Usually there's some kind of, if you want to decode, if you want to, when you want to say, for example, go from say an internal distributed representation to generating a piece of text, you'd want to 
decode whatever that that term is. So I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't. I would have to look into GPT and BERT in more detail. Um, I don't know of them using only one or the other. That's an interesting question. Um, and if somebody else knows, please feel free to share like in the chat if somebody knows definitively. I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, let's see, if models are trained on tasks based uh, like QA or sentiment analysis, how does the model be able to generate text on only info that is not really a task? Ah, uh, okay, because that's that's great. Yeah, it's actually it's actually trained as a um, to predict based on statistical patterns what the next word. So actually, it is primarily trained to predict words like in a sequence, and then um, then that ability to do that is then applied to different kinds of problems. Um, so it's not trained as a Q and A, but the fine tuning comes later when you. Um, use the model to generate an output, which you then map into, say, a yes or no, or to generating uh, an answer. Uh, are we going to receive a recording of the session? Yes, I believe that will be available in a couple of days, if I remember correctly from earlier. Uh, how is the model getting gets trained on, on the fly for chain of thought process? How is it happening so fast on the fly? Uh, I believe what is happening is that it has the text and what it is doing is in the in the prompt, it is seeing patterns like um, like numbers being just described like five plus six is 11 and so on. And it, so what it's able to discern is some pattern. It's like numbers, numbers, arithmetic operation number. And then when it, then it applies that same pattern and it fills in the block. So I believe that's what's going on. And again, this is the kind of question that really needs, needs a lot of research. Like probably somebody can probably do, actually multiple people can probably do PhD dissertations on that very question. Like how is it working? Where does it break down? What are the limits of that kind of approach? Uh, NVIDIA predict protein models, finding Nemo primary galactic model. Molecular query language. Okay, I'm not sure what the question finding Nemo framework for NVIDIA to predict protein models. I'm not sure. I'm not familiar um, with that. And then molecular query language. Yeah, that might be, I, I don't know if molecular query language step for, for example, querying like uh, proteomics databases, molecular databases like CAMBIAL. Uh, I'm not quite sure about that one, but David, if you want to, David Hirsch, I think you had that question. If you want to email me about that later, this sounds like we might have a longer conversation about that one. Um, chat GPT versus human. <laughs> yeah, yeah, chat GPT is a great tool. Um, you know, so much better than, you know, uh, assistants we've had before, like Clippy and my, Microsoft years ago, I was trying to be an assistant like in Word and Microsoft Office. I think chat GPT is that level. You know, it's sort of the next generation of that. It's going to be a tool that we work with. Um, do we think, do I think LM can derive rule, the rules of algebra by compressing thousands of algebra books? That is an interesting question. Um, let me think about this. It's not, yeah, I think it can see patterns. Uh, yeah, I mean, so much of algebra and so much of math for a lot of us is like learning patterns. It's like, you know, recognizing, you know, when a problem fits a particular pattern like especially like in calculus like an integration it's like oh I, I need to use this rule i think there's certainly llms could do that but then there's the question of like really like in humans when we talk about understanding algebraic concepts like could llm generate something new like push the boundaries of say you know like abstract algebra um i don't know that's an interesting question i suspect it probably could in some areas um, there's definitely, yeah, there's definitely going to be some areas where you, you might be able to use, or maybe, yeah, you definitely some areas where ChatGTP or a large language model could maybe find some new insight, like prove a new theorem or, or a new idea in algebra. Um, but it's, it also may, at the same time, it proves, you know, might prove, you know, a small number of really interesting things that are true. It might come up with a whole bunch of things that aren't true because it doesn't necessarily have mechanisms for checking itself. Like, is this, is this true? Like in a true, in a sense of, um, it follows a series of, you know, logical reasoning rules that preserves truth. 
Um, I don't think it has the mechanism to do that. So yeah, we could cherry pick maybe like a really cool finding in algebra, but you need a bunch of, you know, expert mathematicians to cull through all the stuff it generates to find, you know, the one or two really insightful find findings. So that that would be my um, my guess on that one. Uh, let's see if uh, there's other Q&A here. Thank you again. Take care, everyone. It was a pleasure.